So we'd like to welcome Bean Beanland. He's the founding member of the Heat Pump Federation, and he has 14 years experience in energy and carbon mitigation and in conceptual technology selection, procurement, and the installation of mechanical services and renewable technologies. So Bean's really active in the industry, supporting the development of heat pump technology, installation and standards and government policy. And he's also responsible for lobbying activities of the Heat Pump Federation and in growing the membership. So he's going to talk for around about 45 minutes. And then, as I said, we ask, we invite your questions after that. Ideally, save them typing into the chat box until after he's finished, as we find it's a little bit less distracting. But we do want to hear your questions and we think, <clears throat> excuse me, there will be quite a lot. Um, because it's a really technical and really important subject. So I'm going to hand over to Bean. Thank you. Well, I've got to search for the camera and the mute button. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me all right and the quality of the sound is okay. Um, I should warn you, I am about a mile from the cabinet. Um, and the last couple of hundred meters of my line, overhead line, comes across the river. So we're we're pushing the boundaries of, of broadband down here, but it's it's usually fine. So hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be okay. Um, I am going to uh, run the risk of trying to share a screen. So let me see if I can get that working, and uh, and then we'll we'll crack on. Hopefully, something miraculous might happen in a minute. That looks good, Bean. We can see it. Is it good? Yes. You're getting it. Excellent. All right. Um, uh, as always with Zoom, I've never found the right settings where I actually get to see something sensible. But um, hopefully, you're you're seeing a, a a front cover at the moment. So we'll we'll press on, and you can tell me if the slides aren't changing. But hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll be changing. So um, I've uh, titled this, you know, air and grounds or heat pumps, the role of electrification in decarbonizing our homes. All you ever wanted to know about heat pumps and the implications of current government policy. So not very much to get through in, uh, in a relatively short space of time. So um, it'll be a bit of a, a scoot through in some places, but I hope that I will give you enough information and enough of a feel for the technology uh, that you will be able to just decipher what you see and read on the internet and in the press and what have you, uh, and can work out you know, who's saying things that are sensible and who is um, coming at you from sort of vested interest uh, uh, perspective. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. there we go. So, why are we decarbonizing? Uh, and I'm sure you know, most of you, your self-selecting audience, you're clearly interested in climate change. Uh, but I think that it's quite nice to have a bit of a visual. So I'm going to try and get this little video to run. So what, what you can see on the screen at the moment is um, it's a representation of data which NASA has been collecting um, <clears throat> for a uh, thick end of 100 years. Uh, it's a register of data, uh, temperature anomalies. Uh, around the world, and you can see the countries of the world are set in that wheel. The UK sits at about nine o'clock, um, just below nine o'clock, and Europe is sort of between six and nine. So that's the quadrant that we're in. Um, and basically, the longer the spokes get and the redder they get, the worse the problem is. And you'll see we're starting in 1900. So it only runs for a few seconds, but I think it's quite a nice visual that really sets the scene for why it is we're having these conversations at all. So just uh, We'll let this run. Hopefully that's running on your screens and you can see what's happening here. Um, <clears throat> so remember it's it's red and long is uh, is the problem. Um, you know, not too bad into the 50s, a little bit of movement, not much. 70s beginning to get a bit more. Oh, and now look, we're into the 90s and things are starting to really shift. And the acceleration in the problem 
in this century has been extraordinary. You compare that with the front image at 1900. This is why we're having these conversations. Okay, so you can see that uh, we really are seeing a shift in, in global, global temperatures. So <clears throat> why is electrification carbon efficient? Um, so most of you will be aware of you know, the ability to self-generate can generate electricity from solar PV on the roof of your home. Some of you on the call may already have PV on the roof of your, your, your homes. Um, and you'll recognize that that, that is a, you know, pretty close to zero carbon, apart from the embedded uh, carbon in the panels themselves, of course. Uh, but what's happened is we've been decarbonizing the national grid uh, very heavily in the UK for over the last 20 years. The big win, of course, has been the massive reduction in the amount of coal we've been burning. So there was a time when most of our uh, electricity was being generated by burning coal. Uh, as of today, right now, in fact, I was just checking before we started. Sadly, even though the sun is shining, shining pretty well today, we are still burning a little bit of coal. There is some residual coal fire generation. So um, about 1.5% of our electricity today is coming from coal, which is a shame. Um, so it's making the carbon factor of grid electricity higher than uh, one might like. So when we talk about carbon factors of grid electricity, this is the amount of carbon dioxide, effective, released into the atmosphere from generating a single kilowatt hour of electricity. And it's that electricity that comes down the wires into your house, powers, whatever you've got going. So what you can see on the screen, this is a screenshot from uh, an app that sits on our website called Carbon Watch. It actually updates in pretty well real time. Uh, this is a screen grab, I'm afraid, that's been sitting in this uh, uh, slide deck since October last year. So it's a bit dated, but effectively the, the grid CO2 uh, you know, carbon factor moves around depending on what generation capacity we've got playing. So when the wind's blowing and the sun is shining, the grid factor is very low. Uh, and when the wind isn't blowing and it's night, uh, potentially the carbon factor increases uh, and the fluctuations can be substantial. So we can get down to something as low as 30, uh, but we can also hit 300 odd. So it is a very significant range, but it's the average that we're interested in. So what you can see on the screen, this was taken at eight o'clock in the morning, October 21st last year. It must have been pretty sunny because October, it, you know, it's, it's, it's winter, it must have been quite windy too, I guess, because the carbon factor, if you look at the box on the top, the top right hand uh, gray box, it says 110 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So that's not too bad. Um, at the moment, for reference, it's 247. Uh, so much, much worse at the moment because the wind's not blowing. Uh, and obviously the impact of solar has now gone down because uh, the sun is beginning to wane. So at this point, it was 110 grams of CO2. And then what the bar chart does is it converts that number into real time emissions, carbon emissions from various core heat technologies. At the bottom is coal. So if you are burning coal in a fireplace, that's the bottom. The next one up is oil. So for those of you on the call, if there are any who are not on the gas grid and who may be burning oil, that's the next one up. Uh, and the third one up is gas, mains gas. LPG, if anybody's using LPG, uh, mains gas is slightly better than LPG. So LPG would be sitting between gas and oil, but very close to gas. Um, those three are fixed because the carbon factor for fossil fuels is a fixed number. The three columns uh, above, um, the, 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 the top of the gray bars is direct electric heating. So that's sort of plug in electric wall heaters, um, electric boilers, whatever. And of course that varies depending on what the grid is doing. Um, so you're effectively taking electricity from the grid. You use it on a bar fire or in a you know, panel wall heater and it's a roughly 100% efficient. So that number goes up and down with the grid itself. The top two yellow bars represent heat pump technology. Uh, very, very crudely, uh, an air source heat pump operating at 320%, three to one, 
and a ground source heat pump operating at four to one. You can see very clearly that there is a substantial carbon advantage to using heat pumps, uh, uh, particularly if you can get those sorts of um, uh, average performances. Now, this data can, as you can see in the top uh, left hand side, be regional. So um, if we were in southern Scotland and we went to Scotland, you would see a massive improvement in the number because they've got huge amounts of wind generation. So it's quite interesting thing to play with and watch. Uh, and there are a couple of other uh, apps available on mobile phones and things where you can watch what's going on with the grid uh, if you're a bit of a geeky idiot like me in these respects. So, so this is why electrification is carbon efficient because if we can use the electricity uh, that's generated in low carbon fashion, and we can put it into heat pumps, we get a really, really good carbon out, uh, uh, outcome. The Just one word, the vertical black line that you can see on the screen, that's sitting at 519 grams of CO2. That is the figure that until today, SAP, which is the standard assessment protocol, which drives your energy performance certificates for your house, that's the figure that SAP has been using for grid electricity since 2012. Um, so you can see how out of date it is. You know, even on a bad, relatively bad day, we're at 247, we're still less than half of what the official number representation is. So that's, uh, that's a number we've been asked to have changed since 2014. Uh, if we just convert that into this little spreadsheet, and the reason I put this up is because of the last column on the right hand side actually, but this is a, a little spreadsheet which takes the total heating energy, so the top yellow box, that's the heating and hot water demand for a, an average UK home, so that's a sort of three bedroom, semi-detached, um, 80s, you know, estate build type home, so <clears throat> uh, an average heat demand of 10,800 kilowatt hours per annum, uh, and, you know, the units and the numbers may not mean anything to you. Don't worry, it's the proportionality and the, and the sort of le relative levels that are important here. So if we, um, we've got our house, it needs 10,800 kilowatt hours a year. We've got an air source heat pump running at 3.2 to, uh, 3 to 1. That's the seasonal performance factor. So the electricity consumed by the heat pump is 3,375 kilowatt hours per annum. So that's the gain. So instead of buying something in the region of um, nearly 12,000 kilowatt hours of gas, 92% efficient. In fact, you'll be very lucky if your boiler is 92% efficient. Um, you're only having to buy 3,375 kilowatt hours of electricity. So there's, a, there's a, an immediate you know, raw energy gain. What that tells you in that spreadsheet then, is if you look at the last column, what it says is that even displacing mains gas, treating that average home has the same effect as removing 0.8, so nearly a whole average vehicle off the road forever. So if we were to do this to all 26 million houses, we'd be doing the same equivalent as removing 26 million cars off the road, petrol cars off the road. So that's the sort of scale of impact. Okay, and I've just put this up just so you can get some feel, because when we talk about kilowatt hours, most people can't picture what, 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 what's kilowatt hours, what does it mean? But if you can put it into the context that it's the same as taking a car off the road, um, then it starts to mean something, I think, to most people. So, uh, <clears throat> heat pumps 101. Now, if I was in the room with you all, I'd now just say, you know, show of hands, please, you know, who, who's got a heat pump? And I don't know whether any of you on the call have got heat pumps. There might be some hands going up. I don't know. I can't see them. Um, but uh, let's make a rash assumption that a couple of you might have put your hands up. It's typical in an audience like this. And I might have one that's got a, an air source heat pump on a screen pool, maybe. And there might be one or two who have already taken the plunge and have got an air source heat pump on their house. Great. Might be an odd ground source. You, know, you never know. But the point of this is that actually the rest of you who haven't put your hand up will have failed the exam question because you've all got heat pumps. In fact, you've all got probably at least two, possibly three. Some of you might now have four. Um, and this is the point of this is this is not scary new technology. You have all relied on heat pumps to keep your milk fresh and your peas frozen for decades. 
most of you have probably got air conditioning in your cars. That's another heat pump. And some of you may now be taking the plunge with heat pump driven tumble dryers, if you're still using tumble dryers, <laughs> given the price of electricity. Uh, so you know, heat pumps are everywhere. All the air conditioning in hotels and offices and shops, and whatever, those are all heat pumps. So this is not scary new technology. This is very tried and tested technology. Um, for those of you who want to know what's going on inside a heat pump, that, that image on the screen tells you exactly what's happening. And it's very, very simple science, actually. Um, you will remember from your schoolboy and schoolgirl physics that you can't compress a solid and you can't compress a liquid, but you can compress a gas. And when you compress a gas, it gets very hot. The evidence of that, again, from your, your childhood is that, you know, you put your finger over the end of your bicycle pump and you're bumping it up and ooh, it gets hot. So that's gas compression. So what we're doing, and the representation shows a borehole, but it could be an air source, it doesn't matter. Is we're harvesting some low temperature heat from a source. We're using that to boil the refrigerant using our gas, using, using that to boil a refrigerant in one heat exchanger. It's then compressed in the compressor and it gets hot. You know, that's the gas compression cycle. And in the second heat exchanger, the condenser has labeled on the screen, we then transfer that now much hotter energy, thermal energy, into the house, into the radiators, under floor heating, hot water cylinder, wherever it might be. Uh, the gas is obviously cooling at this point because we've taken some heat out of it. Uh, we put it through an expansion valve and it returns to its liquid state and we boil it again. Uh, and it's a very simple cycle. And most domestic heat pumps contain around about a kilogram, maybe one and a half kilograms of refrigerant. That's all. Uh, and uh, for a domestic, for most, the yeah, average domestic size house, that's about the same sort of charge as you would have in a big fridge freezer. So, you know, there's nothing scary going on here. So what do they look like? And many of you might be aware of uh, what heat pumps look like, but I thought we're just putting a few uh, images up. Um, so on the uh, left of the screen there, we've got some typical air source devices, the sort of thing you will see, you know, they look like air conditioning machines. There's a twin fan unit. It's actually still a single heat pump, but it has two stage fans so that um, when the demand is low, you know, so you're, you're just doing some uh, small amount of heating in spring or autumn, you just run on one fan. Uh, it just reduces the energy demand. Uh, the top middle one, that's uh, about the size of an under, under counter fridge, under counter washing machine. That's a domestic scale ground source machine. Um, the one on the, uh, the right, the Dalek, uh, that is a super homegrown machine designed and built in Northern Ireland. So that's the British offering. Um, very different. You'll see it in a different guise a bit later on this evening. Um, what's nice about that machine is it's specifically designed to deal with the UK climate. And for air source machines, the big killer over here, people say, oh, air source, you know, it's too cold. It's not, it's not too cold. Scandinavia is full of air source heat pumps. So air temperature here is not a problem. We do have a problem with humidity. Um, so we have very, we tend to have wet winters. Uh, and the, the ability of an air source machine to deal with humidity is key to its efficiency. This particular machine is what we call UK climate optimized. So it has really good capability of dealing with high humidity. Um, the machines at the bottom I've include, included because um, they're, they're interesting from other perspectives. These are about the size of an upright fridge freezer. And you can see that um, two of them have got the heat pump at the bottom and some form of cylinder above. So it's a nice compact way of including a hot water cylinder and a heat pump in a, in a single footprint. Uh, the machine on the right, on the left of those two is effectively two heat pumps coupled together in a single cabinet. That's the sort of thing that you'd put in a sort of rather larger house. You know, if you've got the old rectory or a, you know, a manor house or something, that's the sort of machine we'd be, we'd be looking at. So twin Twin, twin units effectively, much bigger output, obviously. One of the myths which you may well have been is subjected to is, oh, you've got to have underfloor heating, you've got to massively insulate, you've got to, you've got to this, you've got to that. Not a bit of it, but none of that is true. Uh, there are nuances about it, which we'll talk about in a second, but you can run a heat pump on anything that you can run a boiler on. 
And in fact, and again, we'll talk about boilers in a minute because they are both technologies, condensing boilers and heat pumps are what we call low temperature systems. So they're actually much closer, uh, much more closely related in terms of house are required than people than most people think so it could be underfloor heating it could be a flat panel you know a standard steel panel radiator uh, and obviously these now come in you know two three panels you know so triple doubles or triples uh, it could be a column radiator that could be an existing cast iron traditional cast iron radiator uh, it could be trench heaters uh, under windows um, the unit in the middle is a fan coil that's very typically the sort of thing you'd see in the ceiling in a shop you, know, you walk into a shop and you see a, a grid in the ceiling that's got a fan coil behind it. You find a lot in hotel rooms. You know, it's what's on the uh, above the lobby when you walk in the room and the ceiling is quite low. The unit in that in that void is a fan coil, almost certainly. Um, or any combination thereof, you can combine all these things together. So the key takeaway from here is it doesn't matter what you've got already. There is almost certainly a heat pump solution that will, that will be able to work with it. Now, what type of buildings? Again, you know, lots of chatter on the web. You know, oh, you can't put heat pumps into period and listed buildings. They have to be highly insulated. Um, neither of those things are true. We have just done Bath Abbey. It's difficult to imagine a more leaky and difficult building to heat. Bath Abbey is now heated with a water source as it happens, heat pump. It's rather a nice story because the Abbey is mm, a thousand years old, give or take, 900 or so. Uh, we're actually using wastewater from a Roman bath. So we're heating a thousand year old building with 2000 year old wastewater, it's quite a nice story actually. But fundamentally, we can heat anything with heat pumps. We have domestic packaged product of the sort of type that, that were in, in the image earlier on that will give you 65 degrees quite comfortably out of the box. Uh, if you've got to put 65 degrees in your radiators, you've got a problem with your radiator system. Uh, already, it doesn't matter whether you've already got a foyer or not, you've got a problem. Um, so on the uh, on the screen now, look, any type, blocks of apartments, uh, rows of traditional terraced houses, uh, new developments. The, the image in the middle is a school. And the reason I've thrown that up uh, is, is in a new development scenario, we could consider now putting, you've heard a lot of talk, I'm sure, about district heating. Uh, uh, becoming much more common in the UK. Uh, district heating is very, very common in Europe, uh, uh, but not very common over here. There is some instances of it, but by and large, we don't tend to have district heating in our homes. But in a heat pump scenario, if you've got a big central base load, like a school or maybe a hospital or a health centre or, or something in the middle of the community, that can be a really good anchor for a uh, district heating system, which could then allow you to do some really interesting uh, innovative things around heating and cooling, because the hospital and school will probably need cooling, and you can do both with the heat pump system. So that's the reason I included it, just so that people can start thinking beyond the boundaries of their own home, and you start thinking about, you know, what about doing it at community scale? There are some really good examples of community scale stuff going on at the moment. So we've got the uh, the incumbent fear and doubt. So this is the fossil fuel industry who are telling people that you're going to have to have massive radiators. You've got to replumb your whole house and put in underfloor heating. Your garden is going to be a disaster. Yeah, radiators are in most instances already sized for low temperature operation. You know, your boiler may be running at 80, 60 or 70, 50. You know, that's 80 degrees flow temperature into the radiator, 60 back. Uh, it doesn't, it won't need to. Uh, so there is a, a lot of myth around the sizing of radiators. Most radiator systems and most boilers, in fact, are grotesquely oversized already. When I was an installer, I spent my first eight years as an installer working primarily in period buildings, actually. Not once did we have to change all the radiators. Not once. It's all about appropriately surveying the building to understand what you've already got. Knowing what you've got, so knowing your starting point uh, and getting that right is really, really important. In fact, if, for me, if government was going to subsidise anything, I would like to see them subsidise people getting really good quality 
um, modeling done on their existing property so they know where they're starting from. It's like any other journey in life. If you know where you're starting from and you know where you're going, you've got a pretty good chance of working out the best way of getting from A to B. If you don't know where you're starting from, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're immediately in a, a bit of a disadvantage. So look, we, pr we probably wouldn't have to massively oversize the radiators. And there's really good scientific reasons for saying that. You certainly don't need underfloor heating. Um, uh, garden is a disaster if you're if you've got enough space for a horizontal array where we're putting the pipework out horizontally about a meter down, yes, it will make a mess for a while, but it recovers pretty quickly. We can drill. Um, so a lot of ground arrays are now drilled vertically, much, much smaller footprint. The boreholes themselves are only about um, eight inches or so in diameter, so much, much tighter. Uh, and you know, restricts the amount of uh, uh, headache you've got in having to you know, re-landscape or whatever. Um, but it's it's worth it. And then look, we've been here before. We have gone through a period where we've put central heating retrospectively into houses. Just about every house now has central heating. You know, you've got to work quite hard to find one that doesn't. Uh, and of course, a lot of that was put in retrospectively. In fact, I can remember, I'm sufficiently old now, that I can remember when my grandparents put central heating into their house and um, boy was that disruptive I mean the floorboards really did have to come up and the plaster had to come off the walls in some instances and all the curtains were suddenly there were radiators under the windows and you know, the perceived wisdom was that you shouldn't have curtains over the radiators uh, and not only that all the furniture had to be rearranged in the room because at about the same time the focus went from being the fireplace to being the mysterious box that appeared in the corner of the room with a fuzzy image in black and white on it that we all got really excited about. So I mean, it was really disruptive. And if I'd said to my grandfather, if I'd been old enough, and I'd said, look, grandpa, don't you wish you hadn't gone through that hassle? Don't you wish you were still bringing in the coal every morning? <laughs> you know, he'd have clipped me around the ear and said, don't be an idiot, I've seen the future. So, you know, I, I think that we really have been here before. And we've also been the through the transition from town gas to natural gas. Yeah, so we've been through these big transitions in the past and they might have been scary at the time. Yeah, most people have forgotten how scary they were at the time. But actually, you know, we've come out the other side and we look back and we think, well, you know, what was the problem? We come out, we got something better. And what we're going to have is something better because um, electrifying heat is going to allow us to uh, set, get on the pathway to net zero 2050. And if you believe in climate change and hopefully most of you to say self-selected audience i'm assuming most of you do um, this is why we are taking these steps so uh, a few things about procurement because one of the big problems and this was highlighted with the uh the failed green homes grant i don't know whether any of you might have tried to get measures done under the green homes grant but it was a disaster of course and it was a disaster because it was a treasury scheme it wasn't a Bayes scheme so department of business energy and uh, industrial strategy it was a treasury scheme and it was a covid response the idea was to dump a significant amount of money into the economy to uh, as a as a covid measure to protect the economy it wasn't well thought through as a result uh, and the whole thing was you know, half-baked the time frame for it for delivery was far too short uh, and uh, because they appointed the administrators in a hurry, they got into bed with uh, an offshoot of a, an American consultancy and they made a complete pig zero. It was a disaster. The renewable heat incentive, which if any of you got heat pumps, you may be enjoying, uh, run by Ofgem in the UK, much, much better. So the key is it, this, this question about design and getting procurement right. And the, under the Green Homes Grant, people were complaining so they couldn't find an installer. Uh, that's because you know all the good guys were busy um, and you ran the risk of falling into the, the hands of people who just didn't have the experience because i entirely accept that you know this is new technology for the plumbing industry in the uk um, and what they've done over the last 40 years is they've dumbed down the amount of effort they put into designing what goes into your house um, and to illustrate that, 
a condensing boiler, and you will all now have condensing boilers because they've been mandated since 2005. So, well, one or two of you might still have an old non-condensing boiler chugging away somewhere, but most of you will have condensing boilers. Uh, and obviously the expectation there is that condensing boilers, they are, but they're only more efficient when they are condensing. Uh, and they only condense when the return temperature, and this gets a bit technical, but don't get too worried. They only condense when return temperature coming back to the boiler is less than 56 degrees. So if your boiler is operating at 80 degrees and the return temperature is 60, it will never condense. So you won't be getting 92, 93% efficiency out of it. In fact, you'll probably be getting something around 80. So if all the boilers in the UK were configured properly, we wouldn't be buying any Russian gas at all. Uh, and this is the level of impact. Uh, and this comes from covering up the cracks and the failure to design with massively oversized combi boilers. You know, 30 kilowatt, the biggest selling boiler in the UK is a 28 to 36 kilowatt combi boiler. And yet the average thermal demand for housing in the UK is around. Now that's how bad the quality of design and specification has become in our heating industry. Uh, and the margin of error in boilers is huge. You can get it very badly wrong, and yet people are warm. They're still warm. Great. You know, I'm warm, and, uh, and they've got plenty of hot water. And hitherto, until very recently, gas has been remarkably cheap in the UK. It's been effectively given away free with cornflakes. I accept entirely there are people in comfort poverty. But fundamentally, we've all enjoyed pretty cheap gas for years. Governments, the successive governments, have made it their business to arrange cheap gas because we didn't realise it was a problem. Not only is it a carbon problem, what people also felt in this is that 25% of our air quality issues are caused by burning gas. So you could change every vehicle to electric on the road tomorrow. You'd still have an air quality problem because 25% of the NOx, nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide, the dioxide, and particulates, which is what kills people. So those are the things, carbon is bad for the planet, it's the NOx, SOx, and particulates that are bad for people. You'd still have a huge amount of that belching out from burning gas. So the reason I've got this slide up is because it talks to this, this thing about design. So the margin of error with a boiler is like this. The margin of error with a, uh, yeah, I'm assuming you can see me. Can you see me? Maybe you can't. Yeah. <laughs> It's weird. We, we uh, can see you. Okay, so the margin of error of the boys is like this. The margin of error with biomass is like this. The margin of error with air source is like this. And the margin of error with ground source is like this. Of course, you're getting massively improved efficiency and carbon benefits as you go down the scale. But what it means is that you have to design the system properly. If you're going to be successful with a heat pump, you've got to size. So we're back to the importance of surveying the house properly, making sure you really understand what you've already got. Then we can do a decent design, getting the heat loss lines, calculating your radiator surface that you've already got, thinking about flow temperatures, um, and uh, and doing all this prior work to ensure that the system is good. Now, you know the complaint in our industry is uh, installers saying, "Well, you, you're making us do all this stuff, and the fossil fuel boys don't have to do it." The good news is that today. It's a, very, it's a very pertinent date. We have just had the release of the new version of building regulations, Part L, building regs updated today. In that, there is now a mandate, regardless of technology, technology, technology agnostic mandate, that all systems in dwellings must now be designed to run at flow temperatures of 55 degrees. So uh, we are, we've got now recognition that boilers, connected boilers, are low temperature devices. So we are now on an equal playing field because running a heat pump at 55 degrees in the middle of winter when you need the heat most is fine. It won't damage the efficiency overall that much, not by a measurable amount. So it means that all radiator systems are an underfloor heating. Well, underfloor was always designed for lower flow temperatures anyway, but all radiator systems now in new build will have to be sized for 55 degrees, which means they're automatically already for a heat pump. So there's a lot of change coming. The, the link at the bottom there is uh, a link to the advice that we publish to homeowners. So if anyone's serious about 
thinking about getting eight month, I would suggest you have a read of that. There's a downloadable PDF document. It's four pages, but I think it will equip you really well to, uh, to sell it in the market. I put a note there about hybrid systems. Some of you may have heard this term hybrid. Conceptually, this is a, a situation where you keep your fossil fuel boiler and you put a heat pump in and you run the two alongside each other, um, either running them together when you need them in the winter or potentially switching from the heat pump to the boiler at a point when the air temperature gets low and the heat pump efficiency falls away. Um, hybrids are a, they're a good way of breaking people into the concept because you've still got the security blanket of having a boiler. But you have to make sure that when the fossil fuel element has to be removed, and ultimately they will have to be removed, that you've got, you're not left with an undersized air source heat pump. So um, really important to make sure you get the sizing right and you've got the, the exit strategy, the plan B for a hybrid. Uh, some of these wordy slides, I'm going to let you digest at your, at your leisure rather than talking to them completely. There's a little bit here about location and planning. So thinking about particularly air source machines, not the new generation of machines are, I must tell you, whisper quiet. I mean, they really are, actually. You buy really good quality machines. They are very quiet. Uh, but you still got to think about noise and I think about the exhaust because what comes out the front is obviously cold air. So you don't want to sit that in front of your greenhouse or your patio where you're going to sit and entertain your friends. Um, so you've got to think a bit about that. And there are regulations that will ensure that you're not going to be a nuisance to the neighbours and what have you. So that's what that uh, MCS 020 standard does. Uh, and most domestic air source heat pumps enjoy permitted development rights, so you don't need planning consent for them. So clearly, if you're in a listed building or a conservation area, that might be different. But for most of us, no, um, no planning required. Ground source, no problem at all, because all the, the, the device is inside, internal, so no external noise issue, and actually nothing to see, because once the ground array is in and the ground's recovered, there's nothing to see. So that also has permitted development rights in most domestic environments. Uh, and we've got some new form factors coming through. Uh, and then the last bullet point there is overnight operation. So you're probably getting familiar, some of you may be doing already, with the concept of charging your electric vehicle overnight on cheap electricity. We can do the same with heat pump. With appropriate storage and your electric vehicle is basically storage, it's a battery. Um, with appropriate thermal storage, so tanks of hot water or phase change materials, which are smaller footprint, we can run a heat pump overnight on cheap electricity. So we're massively reducing the cost of our heat. And then we bleed the energy from the thermal store into the house during the day when you need it. Exactly the same as charging your electric car battery. Right? So, and in our world, that's term flexibility. So EVs, heat pumps, both can deliver flexibility. Flexibility is going to be enormously valuable to UK PLC because we are increasingly using intermittent generation. So solar, wind, intermittent generation. And so being able to respond to when the wind's blowing, when the sun's shining, to make use of the lowest carbon fuel uh, is really important. And quite often at night, when there's excess wind coming out of Scotland, you can get the carbon factors get down into almost single figures uh, and you can get really good electricity pricing, notwithstanding the problems that we're going through at the moment with electricity. So here's the new form factors. So look, visuals, do you want, those of you who've got oil, I don't know whether any of you on the call are burning oil, you know, do you want an oil tank outside your house? Or do you want a nice color-coded heat pump? Um, the one at the bottom, that's obviously a you know, nice terracotta in front of a brick house, blends in reasonably well. Um, the one above, obviously dark green, putting in foliage, still looks like an air conditioning machine though. But now look, here's our Dalek again, my friend from Northern Ireland. It's now green. That could be a composter. No one knows that's a heat pump. Uh, that could be a composter sitting there in the corner of your garden. So there's yeah, some really interesting developments coming through to make these things much more visually uh, acceptable than just having a, a grey box in your garden or on your wall or whatever it is. So, um, so we're trying to make these things so much more um, 
uh, much, we're trying to remove the barriers that people might perceive, you know, um, ugly, whatever it might be. Bit of a case study, and I just thought it's worth throwing this one in to give you some reassurance. So this is a barn conversion. Uh, it's actually a barn relocation and conversion. Uh, this is quite a big house. So remember, our, our average house was 10,800 kilowatt hour a year. This one is 60,000, so it's six times the size almost. So it's quite a big beast, and it's a barn conversion, so it leaks, you know. Uh, it's not bad, but it still leaks. That's running just on two Nordic, as it happens. Those are Scandinavian, Scandinavian machines, two air source pumps, running that house quite happily. Eight tons of CO2 saved per annum. And that's the equivalent of 4.6 cars, average cars displaced. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is as we continue to decarbonize the grid, those heat pumps next year will be displacing the equivalent of five cars. And the following year, it might be six. So the heat pumps we're putting in now are becoming increasingly carbon efficient year on year because we're decarbonizing the grid. And for anybody that's generating their own electricity, either with some solar panels or a, or a a uh, wind turbine, or uh, of course, you know, you are heading towards that nirvana of being carbon zero already. Uh, little piece on building regulations. So we talked about the uplift to uh, building rigs, which happened today. It's mandated the 55 degrees. That would improve if you reconfigured your boiler now. And there are plenty of places on the web where you can get some advice on how to do it. Uh, you would reduce your gas consumption straight away. Um, in 2024-25, the next updates to building regulations, now called the Future Home Standard, will effectively ban fossil fuel boilers from new build completely. It will be, there, there won't be a, an outright ban, but it will be so difficult to meet the requirements of building regs with a fossil fuel boiler that no developer will do it. Uh, there's a question about energy performance certificates. And I don't know whether any of you have got energy performance certificates. If you've been in your house for a long time, you probably won't have one. But if you've acquired a house recently, you will have an EPC, energy performance certificate. Uh, and it will have a number of recommendations on it. And you will probably see that it's recommending you put some solar PV. It might say upgrade your boiler. It might say put up a wind turbine. Uh, what it won't say is put in a heat pump. There is no energy performance certificate on the planet that recommends a heat pump because Energy performance certificates report on operational cost, not on carbon. And as I'm sure you're aware, electricity is pretty expensive compared to gas. Interestingly, since the fuel crisis has started, the proportional increase in gas price is actually greater than the proportional increase in electricity price. But clearly, electricity prices are I watering I myself just updated my direct debit payment for my electricity from 118 pounds a month to 185 pounds a month. And everybody's going through the same problem. And some of them have reported much much worse than since that. But, and I suspect they'll have to do it again in October when the price cap changes again. But the point is that the, the, your EPC won't recommend it. So um, uh, this is why we have to do these evaluations of buildings properly in a more holistic way so that we do start getting recommendations. And, uh, I've got a firm belief that in, uh, oh, sorry, uh, in 2025, when we have the new version of SAP and EPCs to go with the future home standard, there will be some reporting on carbon. So we'll start to see recommendations of heat pumps coming through. And there is no recognition for thermal storage. So even if you were using my concept of thermal store, charging that overnight with cheap electricity, that won't get recognized by your energy performance certificate. So it still won't recommend a heat pump. So we've got a problem here because we have a, uh, a measuring um, methodology and as it happens, a tax regime, which encourages people to burn fossil fuels. And here we are, two aspects to affordability, operational costs. So these pie charts break down your average gas and electricity bill not in real numbers, but this is the proportionality. So you can see that the dark blue, uh, sorry, the, the um, uh, medium blue wedges are the cost of the, the product itself. That's the cost of the wholesale cost of gas and electricity. As you can see, less than half. 
<laughs> of what you're paying. Um, what I want to highlight to you here is the green wedge. So the green wedges are the environmental and social levies. Uh, and as you see, the on gas, polluting gas, high carbon gas, is only 1.86%. But the levy on increasingly low carbon electricity, and we've already shown how much we cut the carbon factor of grid electricity, is a whopping 22.92%, 23%. So there's a problem because this tax regime, again, encourages people to burn gas. So we need to do something about these, these, uh, these various charges in order to start moving people around. Now, you'd say, well, well uh, why are electric vehicles so popular? <laughs> so, these are the tax regimes on, on gas and electricity. If we throw, were to throw in another pie chart showing the tax regime on petrol and diesel, it would be eye-watering. So there is a massive, a massive improvement, tax on, on petrol and diesel is enormous. There's a massive gain for an electric vehicle owner to go from petrol and diesel up here to electricity down here. There's already a huge gain, which is why EVs are selling so well, even though they're relatively expensive. The tax regime for gas, so the comparator for heat, is down way below the floor somewhere. So there is no advantage at the moment, no operational cost advantage to running a heat pump. Um, now, given what's happened in the last six months, as I said, the price of gas has increased marginally more than the price of electricity. We have now got to a point where we actually reach parity. The problem with parity is it doesn't compensate you for the capital cost of investing in a heat pump. So we need to go way beyond parity. Uh, government have undertaken to start thinking about moving these levies from around about the middle of the decade. So 2025, we're likely to see some movement in this. They'll probably go from electricity to general taxation rather than to gas, but we'll see. But so, you know, if you've got a heat pump now, we're all thinking about getting a heat pump, there is lots to look forward to in terms of reductions in cost of electricity over the next 10 years. Um, Committee on Climate Change is already reporting in their view that the cost of electricity in real terms will be coming down compared to everything else by 2030. And yesterday, as some of you may have noticed, it's a bit niche, but there was a report from government that says that they are now considering decoupling the price of electricity and the price of gas. At the moment, price of electricity in the UK is tied to the price of gas. So of course, as the price of gas goes up, the price of electricity goes up. But we are increasingly generating electricity from other resources, wind and solar, which are much cheaper generation options. And so if we decouple the price of electricity from the price of gas, and we actually paying what it's costing to generate, then you will see yet another reduction in price of electricity. So fundamentally, I'm optimistic that the price of electricity will be falling and therefore electrification will be the right choice. Whether it's the right choice at the moment for you as individuals is, uh, is an, an open question. Uh, so there's two aspects to affordability. It's the operational cost, which we've just gone through, and then there's the capital cost. So uh, if any of you put in solar PV in the early days when that was supported by the feed-in tariff, there was a subsidy for solar PV. Um, the opening tariffs were enormous. Anybody who got in very early, earning 45 pence a kilowatt hour, absolutely enormous. Although, of course, electricity at now 28 pence a kilowatt hour, not quite the gain that it used to be. Um, but it was enormous. What it did is it stripped heat. Uh, stripped, stripped investment money from heat pumps because people say, oh, I can earn more money with solar PV, so I'm going to put PV on the roof instead of buying heat pumps. We then have the domestic renewable heat incentive. Again, if any of you have already got a heat pump, you might be enjoying this already. This scheme has actually just closed. Um, it had terrible tariffs at the outset, which massively, massively over-rewarded biomass, uh, and that cut the heat pump market in half overnight. Um, so we've had our problems in the past. Um, it didn't help with capital. So the domestic renewable heat incentive was an operational subsidy paid over seven years. So you still had to have all the money. So fundamentally, as a homeowner, you still got to have all the cash. Um, uh, and what, what subsidies and, and grants also have is, you know, they come with a cliff edge because when they close, everything stops. And so if you put your 
themselves into the shoes of an installer or a heat pump manufacturer looking to build a distribution network, what have you, if you know these schemes are coming to an end, it throttles your willingness to invest. And actually, it throttles consumers' willingness because we, you know, you got a situation, how am I going to get on the scheme? Will I make it? Am I going to hit the deadlines? You know, all these sort of doubts don't help to uh, to grow the market. So I'm not a great fan of subsidies and grants, and I think we've got better options. Um, right now, so the domestic renewable, renewable heat incentive has closed. We've now got the boiler upgrade scheme, which opened on the, commenced on the 1st of April. Uh, it's a capital grant. So the idea here is that those who couldn't raise the capital to enjoy the domestic RHI, they can benefit from a capital grant. Um, it's a relatively small project. It's only going to support about 90,000 heat pump installations over three years. Um, so it's not going to fundamentally save the planet, but it's another bit of seed movement, seed capital, if you like, uh, to get going. It's pretty good for small air source. You've got a relatively modest house and you put an air source heat pump, you could probably get half of the money through the grant scheme. So about five, your well, grant is 5,000 pounds. Um, so it could be about 50% of the total capital, which would be great. Um, but it doesn't really help with ground source, which tends to be much more expensive. Uh, and as I say, there's a limit to the uh, number of vouchers available, 30,000 a year. And it repeats the cliff edge issue. At the bottom, 0% VAT. Um, many of you may have spotted in the Chancellor's spring statement, uh, zero rating for low carbon technology, including heat pumps. We've got some clarification questions from government, but fundamentally, um, VAT is now zero. Because of the slightly uh, complicated rules prior, um, it doesn't mean that we're all saving 20%. The average saving is around about 17%, but still significant. So, you know, if you've got zero VAT and you get the boiler upgrades can grant, actually, you would say in some instances, this stuff is becoming relatively affordable. Um, the government has this term, oh, Sorry, being carried away there. Government has this term, able to pay. I actually find it offensive. Oh, sorry. Uh, my um, mouse wheel has a mind of its own sometimes. Um, able to pay is basically everybody who's not on the breadline. Uh, and I think actually it's a bit of a cheeky term. Uh, but I've, admit, I've, I've through talks like this, I have come up with a new cohort of people who I call willing to contribute. And I think there are a large number of people out there who are willing to contribute, who want to do this sort of thing, and they are happy to contribute. Um, now, rather than grants and subsidies, and let's face it, you know, the exchequer is probably pretty empty at the moment, having gone through COVID and we've now been paying out colossal sums supporting um, uh, fuel price increases. Um, uh, I think if we had a loan scheme, much more akin to student loans, where you just get what you need, um, yeah. everyone loves a handout, but actually there's little resistance to loans. Scotland has got a loan scheme running, had it running for about two years, and deployment rates have increased by you know, well, a third, a third year on year, so they've nearly doubled in, in uh, the 18 months. Um, Critically, we'd like to attach these scheme, these loans to the house, not to the individual. So if you sell the house, the loan goes with the, with the house. They're very long term. So the, the cost of the loan is low because it's such a long term loan. Uh, and fundamentally, it will be paid for by the reduction in the cost of electricity. And we've already talked about the mechanisms that will be reducing the cost of electricity. So for my money, I'd much rather see a loan scheme. Uh, it's not a drain on the exchequer. But it can be done, I believe, in a way where the homeowner still gets some benefit. So they decarbonize and actually their operational costs, their outgoings, um, either don't increase or are going down. Now, um, investment in heat pump technology, as we're saying here, it's a private investment. But part of the investment is a public good because you've got the air quality gain. Um, so I think there's every justification in, in having some sort of mechanism that allows us to bring in funding. And of course, where the money comes from doesn't come from the exchequer. Most of the money comes from big pension funds because they don't need massive returns. They need the sort of returns that we can deliver if the borrowing is over a long enough term. So I think this is really just to describe to you that there is a lot of work going at macro financial level 
which will which is trying to work out how we pay for the decarbonisation of the UK. And you will see these things coming through into pilot schemes of various types over the next uh, over the next coming uh, months and years. So what do we need to get to 600,000 heat pumps a year? I don't know whether you're aware, but Boris Johnson wrote a letter to Father Christmas two years ago and said, please, can I have 600,000 heat pumps a year? Uh, there was no policy <laughs> to actually deliver that. Um, but, uh, but that's the target. And the Committee on Climate Change has gone further and said that we need a million a year by 2030. Um, so it's a huge task. It means that we've got to grow our industry by about 40% per annum year on year to get to that target. Um, but what we need to do that is we need consumer confidence. People like you need to be confident that you know this is the right thing to do and it can be done well. Uh, and I believe that confidence comes from really robust consumer protection. And we are consistently beefing up the consumer protection in our industry and it will, will eventually go way beyond the protection you get from the fossil fuel sector. Um, we need consistency of message from government and we need an affordability package which is you know, what we've just been talking about. We need legislation for new build. It is a tragedy that we are still building homes today. Knowing what we know now, we're still building houses today which will need significant investment to get them to net zero. That has to be a tragedy. And the house builders in the main are saying, well, we'll do it when, re when leg regulation forces us to, but not before. And this, the tragedy here is that many home buyers, you know, young couples buying new homes, they think you know, you're buying a house, you know about net zero, you'd expect it to be pretty close to net zero, not a bit of it. And there's nothing that tells them how bad it is. We have now got, legislation in place that will put the version of building regulations that were used to build the house on the energy performance certificate. It needs to come with an information box, but at least it's a start to make people aware that what they're buying is going to come with a bill to get it to net zero. Uh, we could be doing something about it sooner, but again, we've been here before. It took us decades to do something about asbestos, took us decades to do something about tobacco, uh, and we're in not a dissimilar situation. Um, we need legislation for off gas. Now, again, I can't see you all, but um, some of you may be living in off gas regions. So you, you're on oil and LPG. We have got two consultations in play from the government because clearly they're the target. They're the first target because oil and LPG are higher carbon fatter fuels. Um, these consultations are preparing the way for what is effectively a ban, and this will be a ban, on replacing oil and LPG fired boilers in large commercial applications from 2024, that's only two years away, and in everything else, so small commercial and dwellings in 2026, it's only four years away. So any of you who are not on the gas grid, this is coming at you reasonably quickly. This won't force you to remove your boilers. There's none of this, you know, newspapers talk about ripping out. There's no ripping going on. This will tell you that when your service agent says, service your boiler, it'll do you another winter, but then you've got to think about replacing it. At that point, you've got to start planning to replace it with something else. Okay, so this is really coming. This is coming. And for rural communities, and you know, I'm off gas, uh, you know, most of my village is off gas, most of my friends actually are in off gas parts of Wiltshire. Uh, this is coming. And it's coming relatively soon. 2026 is not far away. Um, so uh, those are the sorts of trigger points and sort of legislative uh, requirements that we've got to get to our, our target. So this is where we need to get to. I live in Wiltshire, so this is a nice niche for me. Our forebears knew that their source of energy was the sun. Now, it doesn't matter what technology you're talking about from a low carbon renewable perspective. You know, clearly, solar PV, solar thermal, they're solar technology, it's very obvious. But wind, tide, all solar driven by, by the sun. Biomass, clearly grown with energy from the sun. And all heat pump energy um, is also solar energy. Even with ground source, we are not harvesting heat from the core of the planet. This is all solar energy, which is being delivered all the time by the sun. Okay, so it really is sustainable in our you know, planetary terms. 
And very crudely, from a planetary perspective, we've got to harvest something in the region of 2% of total solar energy, and we don't need to burn any. Now, if it was 50%, you'd say, cool, blimey, that's hard. But 2%, we should be able to do that. Uh, and as a scientist, I think, you know, if we give, this, if we give science enough research cash, we'll comfortably get there. And heat pumps are part of that equation. So uh, a nice quotation there, Stone Age didn't end because the world ran out of stone. The oil age will not end because we run out of oil. And we are at the point now where we need to start leaving it in the ground if we're going to make a difference. And again, that's all about do we believe that uh, we have a problem. And in the UK, I think we're protected from the worst effects of climate change. You know, the weather might be a bit weird. You know, that's strange. But Saddleworth Moor was on fire in February a couple of years ago. That's strange. Hammersmith was flooded in July. That's strange. There's a village in Wales, and I, <laughs> I keep forgetting the name of this village. I must remember it. Uh, where we the, the decisions have been made to no longer protect it from the sea, from rising in sea level. Uh, in that village, you cannot get household insurance, you can't get a mortgage, and property prices have dropped by 40%. So if you ask them whether climate change is providing an impact in the UK, then it's an absolute yes. So, but most of us, we're not really touched by, by climate change yet, um, but we've still got to get a grips with it. And John Selwyn Gummer, so Lord Devensley is now who runs the Committee on Climate Change, chair of the committee, yeah, he's made so I, which I think is a valid point. But we have benefited in the UK from the Industrial Revolution for coal, probably more than most. It's time to you know put something back, as it were. And I think what we've done is we've pulled fossil fuels out of the ground at what I term the environmental discount because we've never factored in the damage that it's doing to the environment, and we've now got to pay back that discount by 2025. So we've had 500 years of environmental discounted fossil fuels, give or take. And we've got 28 years to pay it back. Good news is, can be done. So I'm really optimistic, but it does need, we need the help of people like you to uh, to make this happen and turn into reality. So there you go. Done. Oh, uh, I will just say at the end there, look, there's some links. There's the homeowner link again. And we're happy to take, you know, direct questions. You know, people can contact us. People do contact us all the time. So uh, please feel free, reach out for some help. We can help you with finding contractors, you know, answer any questions you want. So there you go. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bean. You've covered so much, I think, in terms of um, decarbonising and practical social and economic aspects and policy aspects as well. So I'm hoping people have some questions. So everybody feel free to type them into the chat. When you're ready and we'll we'll come to them just in a moment so we need one million of these heat pumps by 2030. one million per annum one million per annum, sorry by 2030 we've got we've got to effectively replace 26 million heat uh, boilers so we've got in, in the uk very very crudely we've got 28 million buildings we've got 28 years to get to net zero you, know, you don't have to be the chance of the exchequer to do the mathematics. We've got to do a million buildings a year on average. And given that we're nowhere near that at the moment, uh, we've got a long way to go. Uh, but, but I still think you know, if we start, if, if, we, if we get on with it uh, and we start, and we, we're going to make mistakes, we have to accept that mistakes will get made. Um, but we've got to learn by doing. And if we sit and do nothing and wait to the point where we think we've got perfection, you know, we'll be toast by, by the time we get to that point. So we've got to get on with it. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my message is, you know, we have to, we've got to progress. We've got to be bold. We accept that some things are going to go wrong, but actually the worst problem is doing nothing. Absolutely. But before we go to questions, it'd be quite interesting, um, your question um, being about um, how many people here have a ground source or a air source heat pump already if you're able to raise your hand or you know li your literal hand or your hand in the reactions bar at the bottom that, that would be quite interesting if anyone's got one of those has anyone got a heat pump at all i've got yeah george of course george who was on our committee who's got a, a very sustainable house indeed 
Um, I can only see one hand. Is there any other hands? I think we've only, is that only one? But as we've established, you've all got heat pumps. We have, of course, we've got our fridges and our freezers and our air conditioning, if we've got them. My car doesn't have air conditioning, by the way. It's an air yeah, you open it the window. Used. It hardly gets used. So um, let's go to the questions and thank you, everybody. Um, so let's see. So first of all, um, oh, we've got a question from Mervyn about donations. I'll give you the link at the end, actually. Thank you for asking that. Um, so just scrolling down. So David says, if you have room for the pipes in your garden, are ground source heat pumps as efficient and as cheap and green as air, air source? Uh, OK, so if you compare like for like in the UK climate, so like for like quality of machine and design, ground source is fundamentally more efficient than air source. And the reason for that is that the bulk of our heating energy is obviously required in the winter. Uh, and, and we get a very rapid increase in the amount of energy required as the air temperature falls. So we burn the bulk of our heating energy when the air temperature is between 0 and 5 degrees. In the UK, most of the UK, is the number of hours we spend below zero is relatively small. So the bulk of the energy between 0 and 5 degrees. Um, of course, the ground temperature, if the ground array is well designed, will still be sitting at 8, 9, 10 degrees. So the source is more is warmer for ground source than air source during winter. The other factor is that air source machines have this defrost cycle. So um, very, very quickly, as you put air through an air source machine, you're taking the heat out of it. So you're reducing the temperature of the air. Uh, at five degrees, air is very humid. We tend to have wet winters. So the, the air goes in relatively wet. Um, through the machine, we're effectively taking out three to five degrees. So when it comes out the front, it's at zero. Well, dry, air below freezing is dry. So where does the moisture go? What it does is it, it frosts the heat exchanger. So at the back of the machine, it starts to frost up. And every so often, the sensors in the machine will say, I'm now so frosted, I'm inefficient, I'll defrost. And while it's defrosting, it's not heating the house, it's heating itself. So air source has these two things in that the source temperature in the UK climate is lower in the winter provided you've designed the ground source well enough. And it has the defrost cycle. Neither of those things impact ground source. So fundamentally in the UK, comparing like for like, ground source more efficient than air source. Perfectly possible to buy the finest Rolls Royce air source on the planet and compare it to a very badly designed ground source and say air source is more efficient. But uh, fundamentally the question is, is it as efficient? Ground source is more efficient. Cheap? No, clearly other way around. Air source machines, lower cost. The machines themselves are not dissimilar in price, but of course you've got all the groundworks. Okay. Um, so you did, but the second part, just looking at the question, is yeah. it worth persuading the council to dig up the edges of parts and buys for heat adjacent buildings? Now, there's a an outfit called, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, it'll come to me, uh, who have raised this concept uh, across the country, actually. Um, we are going to see, in my belief, we're going to see an increase in what we call the leasing of thermal rights. So anybody who's got land holdings, which they can't develop, and you know, parks could be uh, seen as land that can't be developed. Um, Church of England's got land that can't be developed. A national Trust has land that can't be developed. If you have adjacent buildings which don't have enough ground of their own, potentially you could put a ground array, drilled or horizontal, in the in the the under the undevelopable land and sell the heat. So there could be an income stream. So leasing a thermal rights absolutely is likely to become something of the future. And we're going to see it with new development in the first instance, in that we're going to see people drilling borehole arrays in new developments and new housing developments. Uh, entities will come along who will fund and drill the boreholes and they will sell the heat in the houses. That is absolutely happening. We've got we've got uh, plenty of businesses who are setting up to do exactly that right now. Ah, so it's already happening. Mm. Good question, David, and interesting answer. Um, so Alison has a question: Who makes the Dalek heat pump? <laughs> okay, the Dalek is is called the Red. Uh, so it's, the company is called Renewable Energy uh, Developments. Uh, they're based in Northern Ireland. So Red, based in Northern Ireland. Um, I happen to think it looks nicer in green. 
Okay. Um, and then we've got a question like I um, scroll down to you, I can't see who it's from. It's from Helen. She says, does air source pump need to be located immediately next to the external wall of the property? No, no. So um, uh, air source comes in two fundamentally in two formats. So we have what we call monoblocks, uh, which are what they say on the tin. It's one block. It has everything in it. So the heat exchangers, the compressor, everything is in one block. Um, and that would sit outside the fan and everything. In fact, the devices that I showed the images of, they are monoblocks. There is also a split version. And in the split version, you have the fan and the first heat exchanger and an outside unit. The unit still looks very similar. Uh, the compressor and the second heat exchanger are in a unit on the inside of the house. Um, the, the difference between the two in terms of deployment is that in a split system, what you've got connecting the two units together is a refrigerant flow. So you're actually moving the refrigerant from the outside unit to the inside unit. And there is a limit to the distance you can run the refrigerant. There's a technical limit to do with the bore of the pipe and what have you. Uh, it's, in reality, it's about between five and 15 meters, depending on the device. In a monoblock scenario, you've concentrated the heat in the monoblock. So you've already got the heat. So you can put that device you know, down the garden, if you wish, and connect it back to the house with a heavily pre-insulated pipe. And given the distances we're talking about, the losses in the pre-insulated pipe, if it's done properly, relatively small. So you could push an air source heat pump and push it you know, behind the garage or somewhere where it's out of the way and connect it back to the house. The connections, that pre-insulated pipe is relatively expensive. So there is a price, but of course it's a one-off price. Uh, and if it means that your machine is out of the way, it's not impacting on your garden, then it's probably a price worth paying. Okay, J just a quick question for me, actually. Someone who couldn't come this evening said, oh, I live in a flat, I'm guessing that walls me out, but there's no reason um, people, if they're own- so if, you're in a, if you're in an apartment, the chances are that you will probably wait for the whole block to get decarbonized. Yeah. And there are a number of, there are a number of um, uh, methodologies and designs of systems that allow uh, blocks of apartments to be decarbonized from big central plants. So you have a, a big central heat pump system and you pipe the heat around the build, around the, the block um, to uh, what we call ambient loop systems where you, you have a drilled borehole array, you run the ambient fluid through the block and each apartment has its own small heat pump. There are various ways of doing that and the most appropriate way is, is based around the style of the building the outcome that the owners want you know if it's a if it's a tenanted block then the owners may want to sell the heat because there's a margin to be had in selling the heat so they want to do it centrally if it's owner occupiers you know with a share of the freehold then you might say well actually they want to have their own heat pump so um yeah if you're in a block it's likely that you're going to be waiting until the the whole block is done Okay, fair enough. I will report that back, but we'll be sharing the recording as well anyway, of course. Um, Mervyn says, what modifications will we need to upgrade the national grid to cope with the increased electricity demand of heat? <clears throat> okay, so this is a question that gets raised an awful lot, and quite understandably, uh, because the grid has got to cope with not just heat pumps, of course, it's got to cope with electric vehicles as well. So there are huge changes coming on. Um, investment in the distribution pipework, so the UK is split into six distribution networks. So the DNOs, distribution network operators. So UK Power Networks, in your turf, it's uh, USSEN still, I think, Bedfordshire, it might be UK Power Networks, maybe I'm, I'm not quite sure where the geographic boundary is. But anyway, um, they run their investment programs, um, which are fully um, analyzed and, and effectively licensed by Ofgem. They run them in five-year blocks. Um, we are currently in ED1. ED1 is the first investment block in this, under this particular approach. It comes to an end in 2023. The next period is 23 to 28. The DNOs have just submitted their final plans to Ofgem. Between them, they are proposing to invest 28 billion pounds in the networks in the ground in order to cope with the increasing load coming from electric vehicles and heat pumps. 
That's just on the distribution side. The generation side is separate. So, you know, massive investment in generation in wind and in small solar and, and uh, you know, obviously the government are now getting excited about nuclear and potential for Rolls-Royce modular, small modular nuclear reactors. Um, so, uh, so the 28 billion is just the networks in the ground. So there's a huge amount of investment coming and that will just continue to ramp up. Now, if we were to convert everything tomorrow, overnight clearly the grid would fall over but the expectation is that the rate of investment will keep pace with the rate of deployment of these technologies both evs and epons now this is where the flexibility piece has value so flexibility this idea of charging overnight running a heat pump overnight that gives value to the homeowner because they're using cheaper electricity but there is an enormous value to uk plc because it means you don't need the wires in the ground because you're using the same wires that you were using heavily during the day, you're now using them at night. Uh, and so you don't need the wires in the ground. So that reduces the scale of the, the investment required and you can concentrate the investment to places where you really need it. The value of that flexibility to UK PLC uh, has a number on it. The Carbon Trust and the Imperial College did a piece of work last year. They believe that that flexibility value is going to be at least 17 billion pounds per annum by 2025, by 2050. So enormous. So we have to get this flexibility thing right, because that is how we are going to part of the way we're going to pay for the uh, improvements to the grid. So uh, it's a perfectly reasonable question, Mervyn. Um, hopefully, people much more intelligent than me have got the numbers right. Um, but uh, I'm pretty confident that DNOs are getting their heads around this. Much more difficult for them, to be honest, is manning the number of inquiries. Because, of course, they're going to go from what we're we doing, we're putting in 80,000 heat pumps this year, you know, even, even in three, four years' time, when we're putting in 200,000 a year, they've got to deal with those 200,000 connections. So it's the manpower is just as important as the actual uh, capability of the, the wires in the ground. Yeah, good question and a necessarily long answer. We've got lots of questions. Let's. Um, so Sean's got a question. I'm wondering, Sean, you might want to unmute yourself and let us know if you're thinking carbon or cost. She says, how does the option of a combination of solar panels feeding battery storage compare with a heat pump? Both, really. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, again, I mean, it, 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 this is good because these are simple. These are on the face of it, simple questions, but of course they've all got complex answers. So look, um, how does it compare? I mean, Lucy's quite right, you know, the comparison could be made in cash terms, it could be made in, in carbon terms, or a combination of both, depending on the priority of the homeowner. But if you are generating your own electricity, you will get that much more value from it if you multiply its efficiency by putting it into a heat pump. So if you generate a kilowatt hour of electricity on your roof and you put it into an immersion using one of the proprietary pieces of software that diverts your PV to your immersion, you're using it one for one. So one kilowatt hour of electricity on the roof, one kilowatt hour of heat in your hot water cylinder. If you put that kilowatt hour in your roof into a heat pump, you get three kilowatt hours at least out of the other side. So actually there's a massive opportunity to put your electricity into a heat pump and get that much more bang for your buck. Um, now, we talk about storage and, and many people think storage is battery storage. We try and encourage people to think that actually it's also thermal storage, may potentially alongside, so both, but the equation that works out where the sweet spot is for any investment for any particular house between PV and battery storage or heat pumps and or a combination thereof, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, and there's no answer which meets every single property's demand and every single consumer's personal preference. You know, we have plenty of people for whom it's all about cost, but actually there are increasing cohorts of players who say, actually, I accept it's not going to save me any money and I'm willing to make an investment because I'm going to be in this house for 20 years. I actually want to do the right thing. So it really depends on what your own priority is, Sean. Um, uh, and I know that's not really an answer, 
but uh, then it, it would be possible to look at your property, think about how much electricity you use a year, because you clearly don't want to overgenerate because selling it back to the grid doesn't give you good value. Um, but the other thing about the solar, of course, is you generate most of your electricity in the summer and you need most of the heat in the winter. So it is actually quite a complicated um, comparison to make. But there, you know, if you were to um, get in with uh, an appropriately qualified installer who does everything, because they clearly, if you go to a solar team, they're going to say, oh, it's solar. If you go to someone who just does heat pumps, they say, oh, it's heat pumps. What you really want is an installer who does everything because then they'll help you to make a value decision between the two technologies. Okay, that's interesting. At this point, I'll interject and said and tell you that we had a, a really um, highly regarded solar installer give us a quote back in the winter. And um, he was saying, you really should be putting heat pump in. And we live in a Victorian semi. So that was interesting. He doesn't install heat pumps either. So he wasn't trying to get Good man. I like him. Yeah. Or her. Yeah. Or her. Yeah, Chris, who was recommended by Julian on the call. Well, I, I, I mean, you talk about your Victorians. I, I live in a house that was built in 1780. It leaks like a sieve. It's a tiny cottage, which I rent at the moment, so it's not my choice. Um, uh, I'm burning oil terribly, um, uh, but we are a mile off the tarmac, so we're right in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I would put a heat pump in it tomorrow. No improvements whatsoever. I can put my hand through the gap above the front door. I would quite happily put a heat pump in it. Okay, good to know. So your Victorian house, no problem at all. Good. Um, so John asked a question. This just related to we had a slight loss of sound. Just here, a few seconds here and there, being so. Hopefully it didn't. Affect oh, right. Sorry. Anybody? It was just bandwidth. It wasn't. Um, wasn't yeah. your. Okay. Um, but um, there was a slight loss of sound when you said condensing boilers are generally overspecified in the typical house, and the something would be sufficient. Right. Um, okay. So what this? Yeah, what this what this talks to is the fact that for most homeowners, their boiler is probably way bigger than it needs to be for the house, particularly if it's a combi boiler because it's sized around the hot water, not sized around the heating load. And as a result, it's running at far too high a temperature. And the radiators in the house will have probably been sized by saying, well, how big's the window? And that, you know, that's the size of the radiator. So very little science goes into the design of most fossil fuel systems. There are exceptions, of course there are. There's some brilliant plumbers who do their job really, really well. But by and large, we have written down the value of quality design because we've had cheap gas and no one cares how efficient their boilers are. Because most homeowners would have no idea whether their condensing boiler, which according to the manufacturer's manual is meant to be 92, 93, 94, 95% efficient. They have no idea whether it's running at 92, 93, 94, 95%. And actually they wouldn't know if it was running at 80. The fact is many of them are running at 80. So the boilers are oversized. The radiators are probably also oversized. And the technical reason behind that is that um, if, if, you're in a, if you have a notional room, that's a one kilowatt room. So what that means is that when it, at the design external temperature, which in your part of the world is probably about minus three, minus four degrees, if your notional room needs a kilowatt of radiator surface to keep the to heat it to 21 degrees when it's minus three outside, almost inevitably you will have six kilowatts of radiator in there because um, your Radiators are sized on the notion that overnight you'll have the boiler is off, the room temperature falls, and then when the boiler comes on in the morning, you've not only got to meet the standing loss, so you need your, your kilowatt of you know, so your kilowatt radiator surface, but you've now got to elevate the temperature from an overnight of 14 to 21 in you know, about 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. I mean, there's no regulation, but most people would expect the rooms to be up to temperature reasonably quickly. So to get that elevation, you need another kilowatt of radiator surface. So you've now got a one kilowatt room with two kilowatts of radiator surface with a boiler that's running at maybe 70 or 80 degrees. If you were to switch that boiler to a heat pump that's running at 55 degrees, you've now got two kilowatts at 55 degrees, it will meet the standing loss. So that's why we're reasonably confident in saying that for most people, 
the chances are that you will not have to replace wholesale your radiator systems. There may be some houses where you'll have to do it. There may be some houses where you've got one or two rooms where you've got to do it. I frequently would find, you know, one or two bedrooms, those are on the side, they'd say, well, that bedroom only gets used in August, so we don't care. You know, so, I mean, it, it, but this is why valuation of the property is so important, okay? Okay, and that relates really well to Marion's comment about her plumber rubbishing heat pump, pumps generally. So I think, I think you've answered that in terms of it's about the design and the expertise rather than just writing them off because yeah, it, it, it is so. it is all about the design. Now um, there is a there is a, a rider though to the answer to that question, and it's a it's a really valid question, Marion. So the question about leaky properties is this: uh, as I've said, you know, my house leaks like a sieve. Do I want to leak high carbon, low cost heat from a boiler, or do I want to leak low carbon, high cost heat from an electrically driven heat pump because electricity is artificially expensive? So that's the choice that we are asking people to make. You know, because the building doesn't know where the heat comes from. The building has no idea. So a building will not leak heat. Yeah, you know, when your plumber's rubbishing heat pumps, the building is going to leak. Doesn't matter what heat you put in it, it will leak heat. So the question is, do you want it to be high carbon heat or low carbon heat? And if we make electricity, if we fix the price of electricity where it should be, of course, the choice is now high carbon, you know, gas at a price or low carbon electricity at a lower price. Well, that becomes a very easy choice to make. So you're right. I mean, he's 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 sort of right when he says chimneys, single brick. Yeah, single brick. Yeah, it's it's more. It, it will leak more, but it leaks his his gas heat just as much. To be honest, um, the chimney question is an interesting one. So look, um, we all love an open fire. I love open fires. Everybody does. Um, the fact is, if you were to swap that out for a uh, wood burner, you've now got a controlled opening in the house because it's a flu rather than a big open big open hole going up through the house. You know, the dampers on chimney stacks never work that well. So you could reduce your heat loss and you could do this without changing your boiler by moving from a from an open fireplace to a wood burner. In fact, we're just doing a parcel of work with a big landowner, uh, a, a big um, uh, estate that's got a lot of letting properties uh, and they routinely even when they're building new, they're putting in fireplaces. And we're trying to persuade them that actually what they should do is put in wood burners because they'll reduce the heat loss in those rooms very substantially. Um, so you might consider, unless you're particularly attached to your open fires, you might consider investing in some wood burners. They're 10 times more efficient. Um, so, you know, I know it's not the same, but actually there are some really nice wood burners. There's an outfit by close by me. They go out, they buy Art Deco wood burners in France, lovely in glazed blues and yellows and greens, what have you. They refurb them completely, new fire bricks, what have you. They're really good looking. So yeah, there are some really good options around there. So, so what you do, um, if it's open fires, I'd think about converting to a, uh, a wood burner and I'd evaluate the house properly and then see what you need to do. Okay, so look, so looking at the whole picture of the particular house is obviously mm. important. Thank you. So, so Alison um, had to pull a heat pump from a planning application as Bedford Borough planning objected. I went, I wonder, Alison, was that was it in a conservation area or not listed or anything, or did they give a reason? Are you, you can unmute. I can't see you. Can't. I'm not sure she's still there. I can't see her or hear her. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, for the record, without understanding why they objected, um, it's it's obviously impossible to to respond. But um, if it met the requirements for permitted development, then it, they wouldn't have needed consent anyway. So there was clearly something that took it outside of permitted development, um, yeah. and one would need to know what that was um, in order to to understand. But uh, you know, local authorities are under increasing pressure. They have obligations to decarbonize as well. So they'd have to have had a pretty good reason to want to pull a heat pump. And uh, she doesn't say whether it's air source or ground source, interestingly. So, yeah, um, if, if you're in touch with her and you want to get her to put it directly in touch, I'm quite happy to talk to her about that offline. 
Yeah, so Alison, if you're still here and you can hear us, then um, feel free to contact Bean so that you've got the contact details, but I'll be sharing them afterwards anyway. Um, John, John asks about the size of, or the potential size of the hot water storage cylinder. Does it need to be so big? Will, will they get smaller? Okay, so this, this, is a, this is a discussion about flow temperatures uh, and about storage temperatures. So um, if, you are, if you store your hot water at 70 degrees in a cylinder, you use an awful lot of cold water to mix it down to a usable temperature because it's a very brave man or woman that stands under a shower at more than about 42. So if you've got 70 degrees in the cylinder, you're doing a lot of mixing. So if you have a 200 litre cylinder with 70 degrees in it, You've probably got four or five hundred liters of usable hot water. In our world, we want to store that hot water at 55 degrees. So you use less cold in mixing down to 42 degrees for your shower, which is why the cylinders get bigger. So you need more, you need more storage. So you've got the same usable volume. Now the cylinders are much, much more efficient than they used to be, of course. So you know there's not an issue around losses. But I absolutely accept that. You know, many homes, particularly those that where we've been putting combi boilers in, where there's no space for cylinder, this is potentially a problem. Now, um, if you look at uh, phase change materials for the storage medium, so instead of water, some form of phase change material, the stored volume reduces by about 75%. So it's very significant. Now, phase change storage batteries, and it's a thermal battery, not an electric battery, they're still relatively expensive, but costs are coming down and volumes are going up, which again will improve the pricing point. So one of the leading companies in this field is a member of the Federation, actually, it's SunAmp. So if you were to Google SunAmp, that's as it sounds, S-U-N-A-M-P, SunAmp, uh, you'll see information about that and it would allow you to reduce your storage volumes. And it, that can be used to store for both hot water and thermal storage for the house. You can use it to drive both. Okay. Okay, thank you. We've still got a lot of questions, so we might not get to them all. So I hope people aren't too disappointed by that. But um, I, I, I'm happy as long as people are happy to stay. I'm quite happy to talk. So thank you. Perfect. Obviously, anyone else, if, if you need to go, don't don't worry about saying goodbye or anything. It's it's been great to have you. Um, so Anna, um, is Anna's on our committee, and she's based um, at um, English Heritage's flagship. Property Rest Park, which is just a few miles away from Miami, and it's absolutely stunning. Um, what kind of system, she says, could be installed there? It's got gardens and a lake and a canal feature. Okay, so what I would do with that, I mean, I take it Rest Park is some sort of grade one listed pile, is it? Yeah, sort? yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what I would suggest, the starting point probably is to look at what National Trust are doing. So the National Trust started going into biomass in quite a big way, but many of their members have started quite understandably in my view to object to burning trees um, and uh, and so they have latterly gone over to heat pumps in a big way so uh, many of our members are now putting big heat pump systems principally ground sourced into the big ones because of the efficiency over a bigger property um, into such heritage sites uh, and you know if you have a quick scoot around the internet looking at you know googling national trust heat pumps you'll find the examples um, uh, all over the place in fact they've also got a large seawater heat pump system in a place called Plattenwood on the Anglesey on the coast just opposite Anglesey um, so uh, yeah and I've got any number of owners of large period and listed homes um, you know manor houses old rectories you know they're all running on ground source and have done for years. So um, it's perfect. Again, it's about evaluating the property properly and working out what you need and how you get. The difficult bit is not so much the heat pump side, it's how you get the heat into the building. So making sure that the what we call the emitter system, so what emits the heat, radiators, pipe work, underfloor heating, whatever it might be, getting that right is the key. Um, you just listed there in your question some natural assets, gardens, lake, canal. Clearly, in evaluating the building properly, you'd also evaluate your natural assets that you have to say, you know, which of these assets is the lake big enough to support the house? Potentially, the lake could be used as your uh, source of heat. You know, if it's a very substantial building, it would need to be a massive lake. 
probably with some flow through it in order to support it, but worth looking at. Great. So Anna, maybe you can get some English Heritage to contact the Bean and the Heat Pump Federation. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're currently working, I don't think there's any big secret, we're currently working with the Church of England on uh, trying to help them with their estate. They have a stated intent to try and get to carbon zero by, by you know, I think at one point they were talking about 2030, which I think is impossible, but 2035. I, I think targets like that, until the grid itself is carbon zero, targets like that, I think, are over-optimistic. Uh, so, uh, carry on, next one. So, so we've got Jonathan, who's got <laughs> Your old house, it only has an air source heat pump and no gas, but it's costing them about 7k electricity, 7,000 pounds electricity um, per year. And he also okay. added source to improve running cost. Right. So, look, um, obviously, I've no, big, no idea how big your house is, but it's only five years old, which means that there will be an EPC because it's obviously relatively new. And you've probably got estate agent details from when you bought it with floor plans on it. If you want to email those in, uh, I, I mean, on the face of it, uh, unless it's a very big house, seven thousand pounds sounds like a lot. Now, have you got an electric kiln for your pottery that you do in your spare time? That's you know one thing to think about. Where else are you using electricity? But new build. Um, and if the heat pump was in it when you bought it new build, there are no regulatory requirements around the design and specification for heat pumps in new build. There are in retrofit, but not in new build. So it could be that what you've got is a very poorly specified and designed unit. So it's worth analysing it because if it's only five years old and you've got an NHPC or other brands of insurer are available, 10 year guarantee on the house. You could be in as there, there is potential if you can demonstrate that the heat pump is not fit for purpose that you could get it replaced under the insurance policy. Okay, that sounds useful. Hopefully, that's useful, Jonathan. Um, next, we've got Rob. Rob Patton was actually one of our speakers. Nice to see you, Rob. He spoke to us about carbon tax last September, I think it was. Um, so he wonders about the efficiency of ground source depending on the ground. He says you need a degree of water movement through the soil. And in Milton Keynes, where he is, they have heavy clay. Uh, yeah, he's absolutely right. Um, it absolutely depends upon the ground, but it's, it more depends upon what you put in the ground. So you have to understand the ground and then decide what you put in it to drive the efficiency of the, of the heat pump. And he's also right in that in an ideal scenario, what we're looking for is migrating groundwater. So that's water that's moving through the ground through the geology, through the clay, through chalk, through you know, uh, greenstone, whatever it is that you've got. Um, in heavy clay, uh, now I don't know offhand how far down the clay extends at Milton Keynes, and that's, you know, there's lots of geology records to look at, but you know, it may be that whilst the clay itself, uh, it will have water in it, but it's probably not going very far. It doesn't have much of a, a hydraulic gradient on it. But you'd probably be, if you were drilling, you'd probably be going down underneath the clay anyway. I mean, typically a ground source borehole will be something between 100 and 250 meters deep. So, you know, if the clay is only 30 meters deep at that point, it's what's happening underneath. Is there water underneath? Is there saturated chalk underneath or whatever it is? Um, I don't, uh, 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 offhand, I can't think of drilling that I've done in Milton Keynes, but there are lots of, there'll be lots of experience. So you're right. Uh, it does depend on the ground, on the understanding of the ground, ideally water, um, you know, saturated chalk is fantastic, um, uh, but it would be perfectly possible to size a ground array for heavy clay. I mean, in London, it's London clay down to about, well, it depends where you are, but on an average, 80, 90, 100 meters thick. Um, so, but once you're below that, you're into saturated chalk. So we tend to drill deeper there, so we get into the saturated chalk. Okay, good to know. Um, Jane okay. asked, what would a monolock heat pump cost roughly? Are you able to give okay. No, just, just before that, someone said, David Oakley Hill said, I think the organisation mentioned it's possible. He's absolutely right. This is the one that's been talking about using parks. You're quite right. It is possible. Well spotted. Thank you very yeah. much. And as, um, as Jane said, school playing fields as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, school yeah. playing fields, definitely. Um, uh, 
I mean, we're doing a lot of schools using their playing fields. You know, there's a there's a a, a big program for state schools, um, you know, the public sector schools called the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme. Um, the next phase of that opens for applications in a few days' time. I know of at least one consultant who's putting in a hundred applications for um, uh, for the you know, public sector schools to bid for cash, and that's a one hundred percent grant. I mean, that is straight out right money. Um, a lot of private sector schools are investing in it because many of them are, of course, off oil, are on oil because they're off gas. Um, we've just done one of the last remaining state boarding schools in Rygate, uh, Royal Alexander of Albert. They spent five and a half million pounds getting off oil and diesel. They had some diesel up there, it's horrible. Uh, and at the time, the trustees were really worried about the cost. Of course, they're looking at the price of oil now and saying, thank God we did that. Um, uh, what would a mono, okay, it's mono block. So it's mono block and it's, it's B-L-O-C without the K. Don't ask me why. Uh, mono block, what do they cost? Oof. Mm. It, it, this is the how long is a piece of string question, but typically the device itself for a, a, a sort of average home in the UK, machine only, two and a half to five thousand pounds, but installed, you're probably you, you're you're going to double that. Now the cost comparison that's made, you know, people say, well, I can replace my boiler for twelve hundred pounds, and it's going to cost me ten grand to put in a heat pump. What they're missing there is that. Once the heat pump system is in, the next replacement will be not much more than the replacement boiler. And the air source heat pump, if you buy well, and you buy a decent machine, will last much longer than a boiler. So total cost of ownership, which is what we like to think about if people can afford to think in those terms, much better. Now, buried in that extra cost of deploying your heat pump first time round are a whole load of other values. So, new cylinders, new valves, new pumps, you know, all these things are more efficient than the ones they're replacing. So all the pumps are now variable speed, they're all much more efficient. They all come with new warranties. So there's a whole lot of value buried in that additional cost, which those who don't want electrification to succeed, of course, quietly ignore and they say, oh, 10,000 pounds of this, you know. So yeah, I think if, if you're able to think about total cost of ownership, then the equation changes significantly. Okay, that's good to know. I was going to ask you about lifespan, so it's good to know they have a longer life than the gas boiler. Um, so Mervyn asked about new build houses. Might they use heat pumps to remove to move heat outside directly into ducted air inside, doing away with radiators? Yeah, so this is an interesting question which comes up quite a bit. Um, uh, in the UK, we are very used to and i think we're quite wedded to what we call passive heat so the heat comes from a passive device it's not moving you, know, you haven't got air movement in your house um i spent a few years living in new zealand where most of the houses that have any heating at all other than a wood burner have air to air heat pumps you know what we would call air conditioning it's not conditioning the air it's just heating or cooling it but we call them air conditioners ac units so an air, an air conditioner is a heat pump. It's just an air-to-air -air heat pump rather than air-to-water. So instead of driving radiators on the floor heating, it's driving a cassette which has warm or cool air blowing out, just like you'd have in your office. Now, many people would say, don't want that in my house. But actually, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we don't see a lot more of that coming through because um, uh, they're so much cheaper to install. You know, air conditioning units, because there are so many of them, we're deploying so many of them already in the UK, um, they're actually relatively cheap. Um, you'd have to try and pick units where you have a single external device driving four or five internal devices so that you can heat all the various rooms. Um, so that's one way. Ducted air, on the other hand, and he specifically said ducted, where you convert from water to air in a plant area of some sort, and then you have ductwork hidden through the house. That's also doable um, uh, and can be used to do um, cooling and can be combined with mechanical ventilation. So uh, increasing the new build houses, they're very tightly you know, buttoned up. You want to be able to mechanically ventilate as well to keep you know, oxygen levels up and what have you and get away, get wet, foul air from bathrooms and kitchens away. 
you can potentially combine the whole lot and have a singular system which does heating, cooling, and the mechanical ventilation. So again, yes, you're right. Your new build that will come. It's appearing in in you know private build, custom build already. But um, the house builders themselves will probably not head down that direction until regulation forces them to. Not in a big way. I mean, some of the some of the builders are dipping their toe in the water now, but um, the vast majority will be waiting until regulation says thou shalt. Okay, I think because it's just gone quarter past nine, we should probably wind up. But it, I think it would be good to finish with this question from David. He says, should we be campaigning locally, given what we've heard for locally owned um, energy networks to, to avoid pressure on the, the national grid? Um, yeah, now this is a really interesting question about a sort of private wiring. Um, so can you private wire? Yes, uh, there, are, there are regulations about private wiring, but fundamentally it could be done. Um, so you could, as a community, put in um, uh, put in a, put up a wind turbine, put in a big solar park, and private wire the electricity into the community. Um, and we're beginning to see some of that happening with solar parks, not so much yet with wind turbines, but with solar uh, uh, big solar parks, absolutely. Um, I think we will see it from wind uh, and you know, players like Octopus are now out there trying to encourage communities to think about wind turbines. Um, uh, they're talking about proximity tariffs, which are effectively saying that, you know, if you're within 10 kilometers of an Octopus wind turbine, when the wind speed hits X and the efficiency of the device reaches the point they consider a threshold, all their customers who are within the proximity of the turbine, their, their tariffs drop by 50%. You know, so we are going to see these things. And I know that you know there are a small but highly vocal minority of people who say, "Oh, wind turbines awful." Oh, you're not you know not in my backyard and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I think attitudes are shifting fast. They really are. And to give you some some hard examples, there's a wind turbine in the South Down National Park above Glyndebourne. You know, Chichester are very very fussy about their turf. Does it worry anybody? I don't think it does. They're not making very good use of it. I must tell you, but um, you, you know. It, so there are some examples uh, already in places that are considered to be very precious. But the, the ultimate question will be, you know, which do you want? Do you want a wind turbine, which actually is no worse than an electricity pylon? Or do you want acid rain? You know, it, it, those are the sorts of questions that we will ultimately come down to, you know, which do you want? And my final comment on that from would say that in the village over the hill from me, we've got a windmill that was built in about 1730, I think. You can be pretty certain when Windy Miller went to the squire and said, I'm going to build a windmill, the squire would say, not on my land, you go, I put it over there where I can't see it. What do we do now with it? We floodlight it at night because we think it's so beautiful. And some of these large turbines, there is an elegance to them, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think attitudes are going to shift. We will see more local generation. In fact, <laughs> I did get a letter once after giving a talk a bit like this some years ago in Kent. A letter arrived. Dear sir, enjoyed your 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 piece last week. I propose we put a small nuclear reactor in every village. Your sincerely, Rear Admiral, somebody or other, Royal Navy, retired submarines. <laughs> Good. Thank you, B. Thank you for your your um, really detailed answers. Your your knowledge and expertise really useful to have. And obviously, other people have questions, and they are welcome to contact you and to find out more. Yeah. Some people would like to know um... any any of the questions that you, we didn't get to, uh, and there are some great ones. I, I love it. You know, yeah, churchyards, absolutely. I've drilled a number of arrays in churchyards. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so Bean doesn't have any in his current house, which is surprising. Does he have experience of living and installing in a previous residence? Uh, um, no, I don't. But as I said, I actually don't own my house. I rent a house, so I've got to persuade the landlord to do it. And the landlord will come up against the legislation in 2026 that says no replacement boilers. And so at that point, it will have to be done. Would I do it tomorrow? Yes, I would. Absolutely, of course I would. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, but listen, any more detailed questions? There are people asking about flow temperatures and what have you. If you want to address those, please pick up the contact details from the presentation 
fire them through, uh, we will happily respond to all of them. And then if it requires a conversation, we'll pick up the phone or you can pick up the phone. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So in, in the chat, I'm just putting the link to our YouTube channel. So this recording will go on there when I get around to it, to be honest. So it will not be before the weekend, but I, I will put it on there. But I will also share it um, with people who registered on Eventbrite. So if you want to check on a bit again or the slides or share it with people, then please, please do share it. Um, and um, also, if you would like to donate, if you're able to and willing, then it really helps um, to Bedfordshire Climate Change Forum to because we have kind of costs, just things like, um, you know, even just the Zoom, the monthly Zoom and some of our other costs and to able to enable us to carry on doing a variety of free events. So feel free to anytime every pound helps us. And then we've got um, on July the 6th, we've got Wednesday, July the 6th, we've got our next speaker, which is campaigner Rosalind Redhead. I've been saying Redhead, but it might be pronounced Weedhead. I need to check with her. Um, she'll be talking about one time, one ton carbon living. Um, and that event will be advertised hopefully by this weekend on Eventbrite. So if you follow us on Eventbrite or you're on our MailChimp email list, you will get notification of that. And I think that's everything. So thank you everybody for coming and contributing. And thank you so much, Bean, for, for your enthusiasm and your expertise, really, really useful. I think we all know an awful lot more now. There's, there's obviously more to know, but I think it's been really useful. And a lot of myth busting has been done for certain, which we can go and share when we're wherever we are with people who, who want to know more as well. We can go and spread the word. So thank you everybody. Take care and we'll see you next time, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.